Okay, so uh, again, I'm Marty Stevens with the Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing, or CAT. Um, I'll be your host today on behalf of CAT and the Animal Free Safety Assessment Collaboration, uh, AFCA. And uh, we'll hear more about CAT and uh, the collaboration uh, later in the program. So, um, I'll say a few brief remarks about today's program while uh, people are still uh, streaming in and then we'll get going with the presentations. So the uh, um, toxicity testing in the 21st century or uh, TT21C in the title of our uh, meeting echoes the National Academy uh, report of the same name published in 2007. Uh, we're delighted to have Dan Kruski with us this time around, who was the chair of that uh, committee that put together that report. Uh, so um, uh, CAT and various partners in recent years, the uh, AFCA collaboration, uh, have been hosting these events since 2008, so the year after the National Academy report came out. Uh, by my calculation, this is about our 13th um, iteration, uh, we, we skipped uh, a year uh, when the SOT meeting was canceled uh, because we primarily held these meetings as uh, in-person satellite meetings at the annual SOT meeting. Uh, so in our early years, we were focused primarily on advancing the vision in the TT21C report uh, with its emphasis on high throughput testing. Uh, over the years, we've broadened our focus to other technologies and also expanded our coverage of international developments. And those themes are evident in this year's program, as you'll see. So uh, given the virtual format this year, we've decided to uh, shorten our usual three to four hour program and make it just uh, two and a half hours. Um, and we've asked the speakers to do the impossible to give a, a very brief seven minute uh, presentation each, uh, focusing on just the most recent developments in their program areas uh, relevant to our theme uh, and to call attention to uh, any ongoing or potential collaborations uh, that could advance their work uh, even further. So our hope is that the, we'll have a full final hour for discussion. Uh, and because time is so tight, uh, we're not going to bother with speaker introductions of any length. And uh, we won't bother with questions following each presentation. We'll just have the discussion at the end. So um, we recognize that we're asking a lot of the uh, listeners, the participants, that uh, since we're just getting updates, uh, if you're not familiar with these programs, it may be a bit of a, a challenge. We, we hope that that's not a problem and that everyone is, is more or less familiar uh, with these programs that we'll be hearing updates on. So uh, before I turn it over to Camilla to see if there's anything else she needs to say on the technical side, I just wanted to call attention to something that Rusty Thomas asked us to highlight. I think uh, Maureen will be mentioning this, but uh, the National Academies is putting together a new committee on variability and relevance of current laboratory mammalian toxicity tests and expectations for new approach methodologies for use in human health risk assessment. And it's my understanding that the deadline to nominate someone or nominate yourself is tomorrow. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, please uh, pay attention to, uh, to uh, Maureen's mention of it. And I think others might mention it as well. So Camilla, is there anything um, else that you need to mention on the technical side or remind people of? Um, no, just a reminder that some of the people that use the link I sent uh, has my name on it. So if they would like to rename themselves, it's, uh, it's up to them or we can keep a bunch of Camillas, but everything is fine and we should just um, go ahead and continue. Great. 
So our uh, first speaker is uh, Maureen Gwynn uh, uh, of the EPA, and she's kindly um, stepped in for uh, Rusty Thomas, and we're delighted that she could join us. Maureen? Thank you, Marty. Uh, and hopefully everybody can see my slides at this point and can hear me okay. Uh, I actually slide on the name um, NAS uh, work group or committee that's being put together. So thank you, Marty, for mentioning that. I can touch on that at the end or in the Q&A section as well. But uh, I was asked to, today to give an update on our ToxCast Comp Talks work at the now named Center for Computational Toxicology and Exposure. So um, this is our Office of Research and Development has had a, a reorganization. And so this incorporates what was formerly NCCT and a large group of others that have been working with us in the past, but now we're under, under Rusty's uh, leadership as one under one umbrella, so. And let's see, there we go. All right, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna go over just a couple recent accomplishments just because I don't think there was a meeting last year. And so I wanted to touch on some work we did in 2020 that's recently been published and that we're continuing on. Um, these are some of the areas, oh, and one of the figures did not uh, show up, so I apologize for that. Um, let me just see one thing there. There we go. Sorry, apologize. So um, some of the things that we've been focused on in the center have been, you know, those, those issues that came up with, with looking at new approach methods or alternative tox testing method, methods, whatever term you want to use, um, you know, the lack of metabolic competence, the lack of broad coverage of biological space, and then also not having that sort of cell to cell or tissue organ level interaction. So the three I wanted to touch on here of these recent publications um, cover some of those areas and we're continuing to work in this, this space. So the first is a recent publication on what we call the AIM method, the alginate immobilization of metabolic enzymes or AIME. Um, and this is a, a way to retrofit our in vitro assays by incorporating S9 fraction um, into, it's immobilized on the lid of the 96 or 384 well plates. Um, so we can incorporate that into uh, a variety of in vitro assays. The paper shown here published, published in late 2020 um, was looking specifically at the estrogen receptor transactivation assay, but the aim is to, in, no pun intended, to incorporate this into a variety of in vitro assays. We're also working not as part of this publication, but part of our center's work is looking at incorporation of intracellular um, metabolism as well. So we're developing some methods there. Um, so watch this space that will be coming hopefully in the next year or so. Um, in the middle, we have looking at sort of expanding our, our coverage of biological space. Um, and for those of you familiar with the Thomas et al. paper from 2019, the CompTOX blueprint um, for the US EPA, we, we have a tiered testing approach where tier one is really the very high throughput, uh, low resource, uh, low time so that we can we can do a broad swath of the biological space um, very quickly. And so we've focused that tier for our center on um, high throughput transcriptomics as well as high throughput phenotypic profiling or cell painting. And so the figure here I know very small um, on the screen um, demonstrates how we can use the, those methodologies to help inform mode of action and mechanisms as well as look at concentration response modeling and ideally come up with some new approach method based uh, points of departure for uh, making risk, risk assessment decisions in the future. These were both published earlier this year in 2021, and there's a few other papers in the works. What we're doing with this um, effort still is not just um, the human health side, but also on the ecological side. So we're able to expand using both of these methodologies on various ecological species so that we can um, better inform eco-risk assessment as well. And finally, on this last slide, the OCM model for thyroid. So the organotypic cellular model um, for thyroid helps to address you know, the issue of the lack of sort of cell-cell interaction or organ-based um, work. So this was published um, in March of 2020. The development of this model was done jointly with LifeNet, which is a, a local, um, well, not local, but it's a, a, a company in, in North Carolina that we've been working with to develop these thyroid microtissue models. Um, and I did not touch on the variety of interactions that we've been having, but these have been based collaborative efforts based with, um, not only within EPA, but also outside of EPA. And I have a slide at the end that lists some of our um, collaborators. So jumping into something that's currently ongoing um, and uh, not yet published is 
some work evaluating cross-species differences in nuclear receptor ligand interactions using a multiplex in vitro bioassay. So those of you who have been sort of tracking this space, we've recently published, and by recently, I mean last month, um, a paper by Keith Holcott et al. Um, looking at you know, a multiplex, multi-species nuclear receptor assay for chemical hazard assessment. This work is, is specifically looking at um, species sensitivity for ecological species. And um, we used our secret pass model to select what would be considered the most sensitive species and sensitive nuclear receptors um, to, to inform this assay. And so this work is ongoing and we're hoping this will be published shortly, but what we found is species specific differences and sensitivity were detected for all the ligands tested. Um, and it suggests that our, our practice of using um, human cell lines for effect-based monitoring may not um, represent appropriately the hazard to aquatic organisms for certain nuclear receptors. And so we're continuing to screen additional um, chemicals with this work. And as I said, that we're hoping for a publication within the new year um, or this year, sorry. Uh, the, exam the data shown here, I won't get into the details because of time, but um, this is for PPAR gamma, predicted susceptibility is shown on the top for a variety, for the five species that were selected for this work. So yes or no, you know, very basic <laughs> for the purposes of this presentation. Um, and then we tested with a variety of uh, environmental chemicals. And you can see with the potency being, less potent being in yellow and the more potent being in the darker blue, um, you can see that this largely followed what we found from our predicted susceptibility um, with this in vitro assay system. And the next that I wanted to, to bring up here is the, some work that we've been doing, and I know Gino Scarano will be speaking more in depth on the implementation of uh, the Lautenberg Act under TOSCA and the implementation and use of NAMS in that effort. Um, some of the work that we've been doing jointly with uh, OCSPP at the EPA has been looking for ways to, um, to incorporate both traditional and new approach methods data to filter chemicals based on uh, both the hazard information as well as exposure information, as well as the availability of information. Um, and so this slide here depicts a project that we're hoping to post uh, to the EPA website shortly. It's the implementation of the proof of concept study for integrating publicly available information to screen candidates for chemical prioritization under TOSCA. Um, since the Lautenberg Act was, was um, signed into, <laughs> into law, I guess, in 2016, we have been working with OCSPP to help develop both short and long-term approaches to help them identify potential candidates from the TOSCA, TOSCA active inventory. Um, at the start of this project, there are about 33,000 substances in that active inventory. And what we have developed is this um, approach to, to sort of filter and um, understand the available data for each of these chemical compounds, um, chemical substances, and to sort them. Um, we're, not, we're not actually doing the prioritization step, but it's sort of a pre-prioritization step where we will ask the questions in the wor in workflows for various scientific domain domains. The one shown here is the human health hazard to exposure ratio where we look first, is there in vivo data? Um, and then we look to in vitro data. And then we start looking to new approach methods or in silico methods to say, does this data to pr propose or uh, suggest a potential hazard for that compound, that chemical? Um, and then these are sorted and plotted on a graph and you can determine which ones you might want to focus on for risk evaluation or for further study. This will also help us to inform data gaps that may need for further research to help inform the potential hazard of that chemical substance. And finally, uh, my last slide here is just it wouldn't be a meeting um, without me mentioning the Comtox Chemicals Dashboard. It wouldn't be a meeting with us unless we mentioned that. We will be releasing a new version later this year. Uh, it will soon, this version will have over 900,000 chemicals. It'll include a new version of ToxVal as well as a new version of in vitro DB, both of which will have new data streams included. Um, as far as what we've been doing and sort of the background is, is altering sort of the infrastructure for this, for the dashboard so that it will hopefully um, enhance the user experience. So not only will it be somewhat visually different, though it's going to be very similar to, to, to the user, um, what we have done has um, done some things in the background to enhance the performance in terms of download speed 
batch searches will be able to handle much larger import input sets and other aspects that hopefully you may not actually see the mechanisms, but you'll actually see the result of that. Um, we've also updated the tables and we're, we're separated out some of the tools in a modular way so that, um, again, the, the user experience will be enhanced. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to um, list some acknowledgements. I, this, we, everything I presented today is done with a team effort with a lot of collaborators across not only the US, but our international partners. And we work very closely with them in a lot of these efforts. Um, as I mentioned, I didn't have a slide on the NAM, uh, the NES workshop coming up, but Marty mentioned that that is related to the NAM work plan that the US EPA released um, last year. And one of the things that we're looking for are some experts that would be interested in being part of that NAS committee to help in inform some of, of the work that they'll be doing. And I'm happy to share any information later on. I think that's it for me. So uh, Maureen, if people are interested in that opportunity that you just mentioned, um, they can contact you or go to some website. Maybe you can put a link yep. in our chat box. Yeah, I was gonna say, I'll put a link in the chat box um, and they can reach out to me and I can funnel them to the correct people if that's necessary, if that's needed. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, that was excellent. And um, we'll move on to the next speaker. So folks can um, hold their questions and um, type them in the chat box. We can discuss questions or just have a general discussion uh, later on. So um, our next speaker is um, Anton Simeonov uh, from NCATS the, at NIH. And we're very glad that uh, he was able to uh, join us. Anton? Thank you so much. Um, let's see if I can start my video. I guess I'm not able to, but I can start my slides. Um, which I hope you see uh, from the title slide now. I will tell you primarily about the TOPS21 screening, um, part of the TOPS21 partnership, um, which started actually a number of years ago um, with um, really the National Academies of Sciences report back in the uh, 2007-2008 period. Um, okay, so now I can start my video. Thank you. Um, this was really um, a great partnership from the beginning with um, NCATS, NIEHS, the National Toxicology Program, part of NIEHS, the EPA, and FDA. Um, really, the goal was to um, assemble a collection of diverse chemicals not just drug candidates or environmental chemicals, but all of them, all kinds, um, and assess them in highly automated manner on a large scale against a panel of in vitro tests, cell-based assays, um, which had to be developed. A lot of them had to be developed from, from scratch to generate high quality bioactivity data which in turn would be used to um, build predictive models, initially of bioactivity of a new chemical in vitro and hopefully one day transitioning to uh, being able, able to predict effects in vivo. So um, this TOX 21-10K um, chemical collection of about 10,000 chemicals was built um, over the years um, with molecules nominated, procured by uh, the EPA, NIHS, and CATS. Um, and really, um, this is the largest such in vitro toxicology collection uh, assembled. We published on that collection very recently, and Richard from EPA led that effort. Um, there were a lot of quality control measures put in place to evaluate the um, identity, purity, and stability of these molecules. Um, we're planning to actually publish a um, storage effects on that collection um, based on four-month storage of the uh, chemicals in DMSO solvent. So this will follow the initial paper on the assembly of the collection, 
On the right side of this slide, you see a um, QC trace. Um, it may sound like something that everybody can do in their lab, but it's actually not the case. A lot of these chemicals are not um, LCMS friendly. So a lot of work over time went into developing um, QC methodologies. So the collection has been screened over many, many targets, um, things like estrogen receptor assay, androgen receptor assay, DNA damage response, et cetera. We've deposited um, all the data in the public domain, um, now 100 million data points, um, protocols, analyses have been published in over 100 papers. And we've actually utilized the data to uh, crowdsource model building for uh, um, uh, predicting effects of new chemicals on those assays um, around the world with various crowdsourcing campaigns. Um, going forward, we're trying to expand the pathway coverage of these screens, utilizing machine learning and, and other methods. But what I want to talk about in, in the next couple of minutes is really trying to increase the predictivity of these in vitro assays. Um, and the way we think about it is trying to build a continuum of 3D models that bridges the data sets um, generated from 2D cell assays that are obviously the easiest to uh, um, implement in robotic screening all the way to the right. Uh, to um, what NCATS has done on the extramural side with organs on the chip and um, moving towards um, data that are uh, uh, truly in vivo, such as human and, and, and animal. So we've been focusing um, on 3D bioprinting. These are series of photosynthetic tunes to kind of tell you a little bit about this uh, uh, process. You can think about it as, um, 3D printer being loaded with cells embedded in various hydrogel um, matrices and other media. And um, through CAD software, you, you actually deposit different cell types in, in, in three-dimensional fashion. You incubate these constructs and then they can be uh, evaluated by various means. Um, so it sounds very simple, but it's not simple at all. We've been working over the past few years on um, retina, blood vessel wall, skin. Um, I'll talk about skin in a moment. Um, and we recently initiated lung and neuronal models um, in response to the COVID uh, um, uh, health crisis and, and, and for pain addiction overdose uh, as part of the opioid crisis. Um, the goal here is to build these tissues, validate them through various um, means, functional uh, uh, assays, uh, morphology, et cetera, and then utilize them to either assess um, um, using what you would call the wild type native uh, system, um, the toxic effects of chemicals, or you can build disease models on top of these tissues um, retina, for example, has been used very recently in our group to test for Zika infection and, and, and effects of uh, inhibitors of Zika on, on such infection. With skin, um, here, is, here is a very quick um, snapshot of what you can get on the internet on the left side um, from the anatomy um, books and on the right side what we see uh, as, as a construct built in the lab through 3D bioprinting. This is really down in the weeds, not intended to be uh, um, covered um, in this meeting, but um, we've actually published the protocols uh, already for building what we call the reconstructed human epidermis and full thickness um, skin tissue equivalents. Um, to test for irritant sensitizers, combining these approaches with existing 2D pathway-based uh, um, assays for irritation and sensitization. And, and um, scientists from FDA are actually partnering with their 3D bioprinting lab to um, further evaluate bioprinted skin constructs. 
Um, how do you fill these bioprinters? You need a lot of cells. So um, to this end, we're actually uh, putting a lot of uh, um, attention and resources towards developing stem cell technologies. Um, just one example on the very bottom is, um, and this was published literally a couple of days ago on May 3rd, um, the group came up with um, a cheap, very simple four molecule cocktail to dramatically um, improve survival of stem cells and other cell types to um, really facilitate single cell cloning, scale up cell towing, um, minimizing the stress on cells. This is what's needed to actually enable stem cell technologies to produce enough cells to fill these printers to enable larger scale testing. Um, we will be making all these protocols publicly available through dedicated portals so that others can actually practice um, these, these improved IPS um, growth protocols as well as IPS differentiation protocols to uh, uh, various mature cell lineages. With this, I will stop and um, thank you for your attention. Looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anton. That was a lot of material to cover uh, in just a brief span of time. Um, I just want to take the prerogative of the chair to uh, ask about the leadership at NCATS. I understand that the, it'll be changing and uh, what can we look forward to there if my information is correct? So a lot of you saw the news that Chris Austin stepped down and has actually left NIH already to join the private sector in, in, in Boston. Um, actually, uh, um, the venture capital firm that um, created Moderna as, as, as a successful vaccine company. Um, the selection of new ANCAD's director is in the hands of um, what we call Building One, Francis Collins's office. Um, this will probably take a year, um, and um, it's really run out of the ANCAD's, uh, out of the um, NIH director's office. So we hope that we will get a leader who um, is a champion of translation and 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 team science. In the meantime, um, our deputy director, um, Johnny Rutter, is now the acting director of NCATS. Great. Thank you so much. OK, our uh, next speaker will be uh, Suzanne Fitzpatrick of the Food and Drug Administration. So uh, Susie, was it you who asked that uh, we project your slides for yes, you? Yes, yes, that's right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, and, please, yeah. Um, looks like your slides are up now. Okay. Can you see those, Susie? Yes, I can see them. Great, great. All right, you have the floor. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk today about what's going on at FDA. It looks like I mangled this slide a little bit, but uh, um, this is a picture of our White Oak facility. Next slide. The first thing I wanted to say is that FDA encourages the use of new testing methods. They will, we FDA and regulators worldwide will incorporate these two new methods into our regular standards if, if our standards are met. We'll talk a little bit about that more. And um, one of the things that we're trying to do that's very important, and you'll see when I mention the predictive roadmap is that we want to make sure our regulators are familiar with techniques before they seem in regulatory submissions so that um, so that it won't be a surprise I'll be able to discuss um, submitters with the submitters any new technologies that might be part of a, a regulatory application and and we will consider anything for regulatory use that's reliable robust reproducible fit for context of use etc so we have certain criteria but we are really um, want to encourage people to come in and talk to us. So next slide, please. We first announced this when we had our FDA's predictive roadmap, which is a framework. It was really not a roadmap, but over 
view of what we want to do with alternatives. One, that we're encouraging it. Two, that we're talking as an agency on it, that we're trying to um, look at, have our research constructed to look at these new methods, and that we see the importance of working with our stakeholders, like all of you on the call today, in order to advance um, the use of alternatives at FDA. So next slide. All right, so one of the things we did was um, we, because we wanted to work as an agency on this, we formed an alternative methods work group under the Office of the Chief Science and Office of the Commissioner. And we have members, regulatory members from each of the product centers. We have six product centers, as you mostly know, drugs, devices, biologics, tobacco, uh, uh, foods and veterinary medicine. We also have um, people from NCTR, our lab, from the Office of the Commissioner and the Office of our Field Force. So we're discussing as an agency alternative methods across um, FDA for toxicity and efficacy testing. Through this committee, we want to interact with our, our federal and global partners to facilitate discussion, development, acceptance of regulatory methods. And this committee is talking right now to to our European colleagues on the new programs of Risk Hunter, um, on talks and Precision Talks to see how we can work together. And we wanted to up, we have developed an FDA alternative website, public website. We will, we will update you and our public on what we're doing on alternatives. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. We also, if you wanna send comments to the FDA on alternatives, you can go to this email address, alternatives at FDA. HHS.gov. I chair this committee and Donna Mendrick from NCTR is the co-chair. We do both get these alternative method, alternatives emails and we do try to um, answer them as quick as possible. So next slide. So let me, this is, this is, the, this is the front page of the website um, and it's, incur, it's incur, we're putting a lot of information here. I might say and I'll talk a little bit about, I didn't put any slides in on orgas on a chip, but I'll talk a little bit about those in, the, in a minute. But this is, again, where you would get information on what's going on with FDA. Next slide. So one of the things that we've developed, a, a lot of times we get questions from um, academics, industry, et cetera, about how um, they have a new methodology that they think FDA will be interested in. And one of the things when we talk publicly about this that our stakeholders ask is will there be, could there be one place that people can go not only to get information about what FDA is doing on alternatives and that's why we created this public website but also where they can they can talk to them about methods that they want to present. So we have developed a uh, Office of the Chief Scientist webinar series on alternative methods as an opportunity for developers to present new methods just to the FDA We've been doing this monthly now. We've, we've done it for six, um, six months already, and we actively look at the um, people's um, submissions and carefully consider them if they're mature enough to present to FDA. Now, I want to emphasize that this does not mean that we're going to endorse any new method or assist the developer in qualifying his or her new method for regulatory use. But if one of our program centers is interested in the methods, and you know, um, we have for organs on a chip several methods, several chips in our laboratories from different uh, developers. Uh, we will assist them in doing some type of regulatory sharing um, agreement in a CRADA, tech transfer, MOU, etc. So, next slide. <clears throat> of course, because we're the government, we do have criteria in order to be considered for selection. And the first criteria is we'd like you to send us this information. It's on our website too. We'd like you to send a description of your new method or, or methodology, including um, if, if it's a chip, organs of the cell, species of animal, et cetera, uh, a description of the proposed context of use of your new method or methodology, a description of any gap you think it might um, uh, impact, and then of course, some data from your method. So next slide, please. Uh, also on our page, 
Advancing Alternative Methods at FDA. We have all of our publications. Uh, you can see that the very top one listed here is a publication that recently came out on FDA CEDARS perspective on non-clinical testing strategies. And I understand that they just published another one recently. And so we're putting all of our presentations here. We're putting all of our uh, copies of slides where we've made presentations at public meetings here on this website and any other information that, um, uh, that we think is valuable for, um, for the public to see what we're doing on alternatives. I didn't put any ergonomic chip slides in here, but I will, but since it was in my title, I noticed after I sent the slides and I will tell you a little bit of what this, this committee, the FDA's alternative committee is doing on organs on a chip. This, this is a new concept to have this uh, um, agency work on something. So we were asked to concentrate on organs on a chip as our first test case to see how well it does to work as an agency on a topic and instead of the individual um, program centers. So the first thing we did in Organs on a Chip, remember we helped start that program with DARPA in 2011 when DARPA came to the Office of the Commissioner and asked us to uh, start Organ on a Chip program with this picture of a box, a funnel, and an arrow. And we, we started it with them and CATS joined in for the, they wanted a body on the, and DARPA wanted a body on the chip because they were interested in medical countermeasures that couldn't be tested in people under the animal rule. And we could, this would be an alternative to use um, body on a chip. And then NCATS joined a little while later with the individual organs on a chip and stem cell, um, stem cell applications too. And since then, um, we've worked on this. Uh, we have, uh, we, we felt that this was a good example up front when we had our regulators there at the very beginning when DARPA announced the BAA for these body on a chip things, really talking to potential developers about, for example, what our, our gaps are in regulatory knowledge, uh, what we thought good reference compounds were for the different organs on a chip, et cetera, and really emphasized to FDA that um, we needed to be there um, up front when new methods are being developed, not waiting passively until we might see something in an application. That was sort of the basis for developing the predictor roadmap where we said regulators should be up there. We should be uh, participating up front. So one of the things we developed because we noticed that there's a lot of different definitions for microphysiological systems and organs on a chip, we developed a working definition for um, organs on a chip and microphysiological systems. And if you go to our webpage and all you have to do is type in Google FDA alternatives and you'll get there, you will see our working definition. And I invite you to make any comments at all on this. We are we're gonna be working on some other definitions too. And I have a list of them here, what we mean by NAMS translation. We've already defined context of use, um, regulatory science, for, performance criteria, other things so that you know that when FDA says, uh, say microphysiological systems, you'll know what we mean by that. We've also been working with the IQ Consortium MPS um, affiliate to work on looking at different aspects of organs on the chip. We've had some internal seminars and we we're working on some other things. So this is one example of us uh, reaching out to our stakeholders to talk, to talk to them about um, what we're doing. As I said, when we put the definition of microphysiological systems and organs on a chip on our website, it was a working definition because we wanted input from all of you before we made anything final. Uh, next slide. So we also, also um, developed um, a, an FD alternative report. This was released January 5th, 2021. Um, this was really a snapshot of what each of our program centers are doing in alternatives, what the uh, what we're doing across agency, what we're doing with um, different working groups like HESI, um, and what we're doing with um, global um, EU tox risk, that kind of stuff, and then uh, ICCR for cosmetics. 
and then some global meeting. So it really it gives you a snapshot. It's not inclusive, but it does give you a snapshot of what's going on. It, and uh, both our former commissioner and our office of the chief scientist reinforces the fact that FDA is committed to advancing um, alternatives, new alternative methodology of FDA. The other reason this is important, and, and, and Dr. Casey or whoever is representing ICFAM may mention this too, is that recently ICFAM was asked, um, uh, through Congress asked ICFAM to develop a report on how each federal agency uh, tracked and made public their progress on advancing alternatives. They had suggested um, that we count animals for that. Now, FDA co-chaired this committee for ICFAM, and, and, for, IC, and for, for metrics, FDA didn't think that um, counting animals was an appropriate metric. So we committed that we would keep our stakeholders, including Congress, up to date on what we were doing um, to advance new alternative methods under the three R's by putting it on this website, FDA's alternative website. So we made that commitment to you, to the public, that we're gonna to try to keep this as updated as possible um, so that you can see that we are making progress in this area. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, just to talk a little bit about validation because people ask you about this, it used to be a one size fits all validation procedure. Um, there was no clarity on what the purpose or use of the test method was. Um, they always used um, traditional tests as gold standards, and it was a full replacement, one for one. <clears throat> so we've, we've moved beyond that. Um, and uh, next slide. To develop what at, we use at FDA, what's called a context of use qualification. So we, we developed the concept of qualification with the conclusion that the results of an assessment using a model assay, whatever, can be relied upon for a specific interpretation or application or context of use in product development and regulatory decision making. So that the biggest concept is a context of use, which is a clearly defined articulated description delineate the manner and purpose of use for a particular approach. So we found that actually delineating a context of use is probably the most difficult part of this, but it really starts, I think it really clarifies how are you gonna use the method and what type of information you need to qualify it. And so next slide, please. So these are some, you know, I have a, a graphic. And um, so to begin with, you might wanna start thinking about what's the regulatory gap where additional data are needed? Why aren't current models useful? What must the new model have? How will the new model be qualified as being good or better than its existing models? Um, how will I use the data to refine a regulatory decision and what's the impact of that decision? These are questions you might ask yourself. These are questions that we would ask ourselves at FDA looking at a new method. Next slide. So here's the, again, starting with the regulatory use and, and really the question defines how much data is needed to qualify it. If it's a discovery method, a screening method, you're not gonna lead, need a lot of data um, where if you're trying to replace a pivotal study, non-clinical study, it, it, the um, bar is much higher. So, um, and, and I like to say, to myself, what's the consequences of making a wrong decision on qualifying a study, uh, on using a new method? If it's a screening method, you might not advance a compound that's, you know, economically would be good. But if you replace a pivotal study with an alternative and that pivot, that alternative isn't, isn't, isn't working well, or it, it might, that's the, the consequences are much higher. So how, so one of the things you also have to define is applicable um, domains and limitations, the context of use, choice of reference compounds should be related to the context of use and not from a generic library. And I think I have one more slide, please. So this is, this I borrowed from um, 
Paul Brown, actually the last one too. So he gets credit, but I, I don't really think that, I think the biggest question that we have to answer for alternatives is how do you show it that it's relevant to humans? The new data is relevant to unions. Most of the other questions are, are ones that have been um, here for, um, you know, that have been here for a while um, about um, uh, what is, is it, re, is it reproducible? What test counts have you used? What's the applicability domain? Um, what are the sensitivity and specificity? But the biggest point are, how are the endpoints being measured and are they translatable to humans? And I hope that as we move forward with um, putting um, alternatives into regulatory use that we have a lot of discussion on that particular question. So next slide. Susie, I think we need to move on. Oh, okay, so we can stop. This is fine. We just, um, um, this is just, this is the last slide. This is just what to think about when we, we want to talk to you. So you, you can, that's it. Next, okay. I think the next slide is just nothing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Susie, very much. That was quite informative. And I, I think it's uh, quite something that the FDA is acting as um, uh, one entity on uh, this issue, uh, given that it's very silo driven usually. So uh, hats off to FDA on this. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Louis uh, slash Gino Scarano from EPA, who will be talking to us about progress in implementing NAMS under TASCA. Gino? Uh. Thanks. Uh, can you see my slides? No, Gino, we were actually seeing your uh, desktop with your, if you switch that, let's see, if we click on that. Uh, I think you might want to just, oh, there maybe. you go. All set. Okay. So sorry. And thanks, Martin. And um, I want to thank, I'm stepping in at the last minute for Todd Stedford and Tala Henry who put these slides together. So um, just briefly, I'm going to cover three topics. Uh, one slide on toxic reform, one on the section in TSCA that um, speaks to reduction of testing invertebrates, which most of you are aware of, and then six or seven slides on the progress for implementing uh, NAMS under TSCA. So the original TSCA was uh, passed in 1976, and I think all of you probably have seen this picture 40 years later where the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act for the 21st century was signed into law. And uh, this is uh, the nation's primary chemicals management law. Um, Section 4H of the new law is brand new and it talks about reduction of testing invertebrates. And I just wanna speak to the first section here, section 4H1, where the agency, where we have to, before we request, testing using vertebrates. And I think everyone's aware that under TSCA, there's no toxicity data requirements. So we don't have a list of, of studies that need to be submitted, but we do have the ability to uh, request studies or require them if we think it's needed. And before we do, uh, the new part of the law says we have to consider reasonably available and existing information. And uh, that second sub bullet is always important and um, I think has been the driving force for a lot of uh, people in this field for the past five years, where we need to uh, encourage and facilitate scientifically valid test methods and strategies that reduce or replace vertebrate animals while providing information of equivalent or better scientific quality and relevance. And the other two things that are, are noteworthy in the law is the, uh, the um, push to group chemicals uh, two or more chemicals into scientifically appropriate categories. So you can do read across and you don't have to test each member of a category and the formation of uh, industry consortia to jointly conduct uh, studies so that it doesn't do any unnecessary duplication. So on this slide, I'm just providing, pro pro providing six examples of uh, how we're implementing NAMS to evaluate both hazard and exposure for both new and existing chemicals. 
I think in the past we focused mostly on exist new chemicals when we present this information in this forum. I think many of you are aware of the draft policy to reduce animal testing for skin sensitization. We uh, we um, published in April, largely due to or largely through the work of our sister office, the Office of Pesticide Programs and NICETAM, who I think Nicole is going to be talking next. They did a lot of the gr groundwork for that. Um, what we have done is we've um, started to review the all the uh, um, skin sensitization NAM studies that have been submitted since Lautenberg was enacted. And we're working through them and, and are going to use them to help uh, finalize the policy. Uh, the second item is an exposure item. And uh, that's in March of 2019. Um, we uh, released a screening exposure uh, modeling tool, the integrated uh, indoor outdoor air calculator, affectionately known as IIOAC. And this tool allows us to refine our exposure assessments, especially for new chemicals, um, by estimating indoor and outdoor air concentrations, as well as particle deposition by distance from where a chemical is released to air from a, a facility. And the important thing here is our normal tool, EFAST, which is uh, exposure and fate assessment screen tool, um, doesn't allow this kind of refinement. So uh, what we might have considered a concern and asked for testing, this refinement allows us to better uh, understand exposures and determine whether or not there is a true need for testing. Um, the third bullet um, is a, uh, a rule uh, where we revoked a, a previous rule, a significant new use rule for new chemicals um, based on NAM data. And in this case, it was on in vitro biosolubility. Um, our original assessment uh, where, we, where we published the significant new use rule um, uh, uh, was uh, suggesting lung effects uh, um, associated with the, this polymer and um, when we uh, and we were concerned about lung overload so we ended up developing a working with the submitter and developing a tiered system where let's look and see in vitro the biosolubility of, of the polymer not the water solubility not the lipid solubility where we're talking about solubility in lung fluid and so that helped us make a determination that there was no need for inhalation toxicity studies in rats. Um, the fourth uh, example is for exi an existing chemical risk evaluation, which is the term of art for the TOSCA risk assessments. And in that one, we used a, a NAM, the Species Sensitivity Distribution Toolbox, for environmental hazard. And uh, in that tool, we were able to use it to predict the concentration of trichloroethylene, in this case, that would be protective for 95% of the aquatic species and to demonstrate that the aquatic invertebrate were the most sensitive taxonomic group to short-term TCE exposures. The fifth item is the January 2021 release of version nine of Oncologic, which is a predictive tool to, for assessing cancer for organic chemicals. Um, and uh, th this was recently released and uh, the, Version eight is still available and useful. That particular, the old version um, is uh, used for cancer prediction for fibers and metals and polymers. And this last item on this slide is um, uh, through our collaborators with, with in ORD, um, we've, uh, uh, ORD had uh, overseen a, a external peer review of the multiple path particle particle dosimetry or MPPD model software, which is used by us and many others for in inhalation dosimetry and refining uh, um, our exposure and risk estimates. And this uh, MPPD was a peer review panel and public comment was announced in March of 2021. The public comment period uh, closed in April. And I believe that the actual peer review meeting was last week. On this next slide, a few more uh, progress uh, uh, updates. Um, 
The first one, and uh, Maureen alluded to uh, the prioritization effort. As we say in our strategic plan, uh, we do plan to use NAMS to identify candidates for prioritizing the existing chemicals under TOSCA for TOSCA risk evaluations. And we did put out a conceptual approach in September of 18. I think Maureen pointed to um, ORD's uh, document, which is going to be released shortly uh, on a proof of concept, which would go to the next step. And I think it's also important that that second sum bullet to talk about how we did use NAM information when, as required under TOSCA for existing chemicals, we had to also identify low priority chemical substances. So these would be substances where we don't feel the need to perform a risk evaluation. And so some NAM information was used to identify those 20 chemicals. And I would like to also mention that specific to this particular topic of prioritizing chemicals, uh, some of you may be aware that our office was reorganized in late fall of 2020 and uh, became effective in October, November timeframe. And so we now have a new division within the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics, which is called DGAD, uh, Data, Ga Data Gathering and Analysis Division. And this group has scientists who will be working exclusively on uh, this prioritization effort. Um, the second major topic here is collaboration. Um, and I think many of you are aware of what we call the PEP webinars where we're fortunate to work with the PETA Science Consortium International and the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine uh, for the PETA, EPA, PCRM, or PEP webinar series, which we started back in November of 2018. And we've had about eight since then. And the presenters are academics, regulatory folks, industry, um, and uh, different science consulting organizations. Um, the last bullet here speaks to, uh, in terms of collaboration, advancing the science of NAMS or lung effects category, which has been a major part of our work the past year. And uh, for this, the next two slides, we simply show some um, posters that we've had uh, um, that look at two of four subcategories. One is on surfactants and then one is on poorly soluble low toxicity polymers. And the SNR revocation I spoke of earlier has to do with the poorly soluble low toxicity polymers. But if you can see on this slide for the surfactants, um, I don't expect you to read it. And I don't expect you to read this next one on PSLTs or poorly soluble low toxicity um, polymers. But the important point here is that each of these IATAs um, represent strategies for evidence integration and uh, evaluation to aid in the assessment of chemicals that fit within the boundaries of these categories and for which there's limited data and it presents an approach for how to evaluate them. Um, I'd like to also mention that there, there are a lot of different collaborators from different organizations um, and uh, they have uh, conditionally accepted manuscripts in uh, chemical research and toxicology. And I just found out that the uh, surfactant manuscript has been accepted fully and will be published shortly. And on this last slide, um, one of the requirements in the new law is that we have to maintain uh, and regularly update a list of NAMs that are acceptable for use in TOSCA. And uh, we call this affectionately the 4H2C list. Um, the first list came out as required when we published our strategic plan of June of 2018. Uh, the first and second updates were published in December of 19 and February of 21. And that's it. And I don't have to show this slide because we're not doing questions till the end. So thank you, Martin and others. Gino, thank you so much for stepping in uh, to give this presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. It's great to see the agencies work on this issue, the collaborations with uh, PETA and PCRM and mm -hmm. the translation to policy. So uh, hats off. Our next speaker is Nicole Kleistruer, uh, who will give the uh, ICVAM 
NICEDAM presentation, and I'll uh, let her unpack those acronyms. Thanks, Marty. And thanks everybody for attending today. Um, so yeah, I, I think a lot of folks are familiar with us, but just very quickly, high level overview. So NICEDAM stands for the National Toxicology Program Interagency Center for the Evaluation of Alternative Toxicological Methods. Um, we are housed within the division of the NTP at NIEHS, um, but we provide support to ICVAM, which is the Interagency Coordinating Committee for Validation of Alternative Methods. So this is a congressionally mandated committee of representatives from 17 different US federal agencies um, that either require or consider chemical safety testing data and are interested in evolving from a reliance on traditional regulatory standard in vivo test methods to more efficient, more rapid, potentially more human relevant and mechanistically informative um, non-animal alternatives. So uh, NICETAM is kind of the resource arm of, of ICVAM. ICVAM is a voluntary committee. All the participation of all the representatives is supported by their individual agencies, but ICVAM doesn't have a dedicated budget. Um, the resourcing for ICVAM comes on the NICETAM side. So we have a 20 person group that provides uh, scientific and administrative support to ICVAM. And, and the work that we do is really dictated by our ICVAM agency stakeholders and their priorities. So um, this is a really fabulous resource that I think I, I would love for folks to be aware of and go check out. So this is the biennial progress report from ICVAM that's published every two years as part of our congressional mandate. So the most recent version just came out in July of last year. And um, you can download it as, an entire, as a PDF document if you wish, but it's nice because the last couple iterations have been provided in a web-based searchable format. So you can go and you can, um, you can see here this, this uh, little search box right here. You can search by agency. Um, so if you're curious on all of the things that FDA is doing in the area of alternatives or EPA or Department of Defense, you can search by, by that keyword, or you can search by particular endpoint like developmental toxicity or cancer or um, particular keywords like adverse outcome pathways. So uh, it's a really, really nice kind of high level uh, one to two paragraph summary of all the different activities going on in promoting alternatives or reducing animal use across all the different US agencies. And I think this was the first time that we actually had substantive contributions from every single ICBAM member agency. And then also, if you're not all subscribed to the NICETAM news email list, I would encourage you to do so. You get newsletters every week or so on um, updates in the alternative space. So um, this is a 30,000 foot view of all of the different projects that we have going on, most of which I do not have time to talk to you about today, but I just want to make you aware of all of the different spaces that we work in in case there's a desire to follow up offline about any of these particular topics. Um, and you can see that they cover sort of computational tool and workflow development, reference data curation, um, specific ICTES, evaluation of particular model systems. Um, and then most recently, we're sort of tackling the evolving process of validation uh, with a newly formed ICVAM validation work group that will be uh, completely rewriting the old 1997 um, ICVAM validation guidance document to really update it and incorporate the concepts of establishing scientific confidence in a fit for purpose performance-based manner that's based on context of use for particular applications. So one area where we've spent a lot of time and resources recently over the last several years is in support of the US EPA's objectives to either replace or significantly reduce the use of alternatives for what's known as the acute six pack. So these are three acute systemic toxicity tests and three acute um, topical toxicity tests that are required for um, pesticide chemicals. And so you can see them listed here. And I just wanted to give you a status update on the progress towards replacement for each of these endpoints. Uh, for dermal lethality, I think we can call that a win. So there's a, a waiver guidance available that the EPA put out. Um, for oral lethality, we have a newly published manuscript. Um, we actually have 
uh, five papers uh, that have come out in this area, literally in the last like three to four weeks. Um, so the first one cited here, the Mansouri et al. paper, is about CATMOS, so the Collaborative Acute Toxicity Modeling Suite. And this is a suite of in silico models for predicting acute oral lethality. Um, and we're looking also at using the GHS additivity uh, formula for predicting uh, acute systemic lethality for uh, formulations. And we um, have a paper, the Ham et al. paper that's just been accepted to regulatory tox farm uh, pending minor revisions. So that should be available online within the next couple of weeks. Um, so for inhalation lethality, we're doing something similar. Um, so we're building a database of LC50 values to try and develop in silico computational QSAR models to predict that endpoint. Um, there's also some, some 3D models, um, sort of com complex organotypic models that are being evaluated for this endpoint as well. For eye irritation and skin irritation, I think most people are aware of the, the work that's ongoing at the OECD. There's a number of test guidelines for either top-down or bottom-up approaches to delineate non-irritant or corrosive chemicals. And then to try and get at that middle ground of mild and moderate irritants for both eye and skin, we have a number of projects ongoing um, in the prospective testing space to kind of fill out that data set and develop defined approaches that are based on non-animal methods. And then for skin sensitization, um, many of you who know me know that this is an endpoint that's sort of near and dear to my heart that I've worked very, very closely with our EU and Canadian colleagues on for the last several years um, in, in, in trying to implement a defined approach for skin sensitization guideline at the OECD. Um, and I'm delighted to report that at the most recent WNT meeting, um, this was a formally approved and then, well, sorry, it was initially approved and then hopefully will be formally adopted by the Chemicals and Biotechnology Committee meeting later in, in this year in June. Um, so we will uh, soon have the first ever defined approach guideline um, under the OECD for skin sensitization. So I, I think we can call that one a success too. And of course, there's some existing documents that the EPA has put out over the last couple of years, uh, draft science policy, accepting non-animal defined approaches for this endpoint, and even a draft risk assessment um, using a defined approach to derive a quantitative point of departure. And all of that work wouldn't be possible without the support of um, our colleagues on this project, particularly the OECD Secretariat and Patience Brown, who I think is online. Um, I'll just spend the last few minutes uh, walking you through a resource that um, we continue to update a couple times a year. Um, we like to call this our baby dashboard. So the, the EPA's um, complex chemicals dashboard is a, is a tremendous resource, which I use on an almost daily basis. Um, ICE intends to provide a slightly different perspective. So the ability to upload large lists of chemicals or select from lists of reference chemicals and join multiple different data sets together. So we have a large amount of highly curated reference data, both in vitro and legacy in vivo animal data in here. And we just released a major update of ICE um, in conjunction with the SOT meeting in March. So ICE version 3.3 has a bunch of new tools in it that I'll um, speed through very quickly. First, there's this uh, concept of curation of the high throughput screening data. So I think this is the only place that you can access a version of the Tox, Tox 21 and ToxCast data that actually incorporates the chemical QC information and some technology specific flags that are derived from the EPA's um, curve fitting and hit calling pipeline and then put into the Nicetum workflow to essentially provide warnings for people as they're using the data that this chemical sample may have actually failed the analytical QC and so maybe a more of a low confidence value. We've also spent a lot of time and resources annotating the assays, so grouping them by biological process, mechanistic target, and mode of action and linking those two ontologies like the NCI metathesaurus and the gene ontology processes. So that's done um, both in terms of 
mechanistic targets and then also in terms of mode of action. So you have a mul multiple different ways that you can search through the high throughput screening assays and get that biological context, which is so valuable for folks that may be less familiar with the platforms. Um, we also have a new tool called Curve Surfer, which is an interactive concentration response visualization tool for the high throughput screening data. Um, and so this allows you to really dig into the concentration response curves and, and look for yourself and decide whether you think it's, it's real activity or not. Um, you can filter or subselect the curves that you look at based on those mechanistic target annotations. Um, you can do this for large groups of chemicals or groups of assays for specific chemicals. You can filter on activity calls or AC50 cutoffs. Uh, we also have a couple of workflows that are specific to um, trying to do that translation between in vitro and in vivo. So we have a PBPK tool. We work very closely with John Wombo's group at the EPA that has developed the HTTK R package. And so that um, composes most of the back end of this tool. We also have some in-house code with some additional PBPK models. And this allows you to um, take an external dose and estimate tissue level concentrations. Um, again, you can do that for individual chemicals or groups of chemicals. And then you can do it in the reverse as well. So you can do that reverse uh, extrapolation from in vitro to predicted in vivo exposures that would result in those internal plasma level or tissue level concentrations. And via this IVIVE workflow, again, we're, we're leveraging that annotation to mechanistic target um, to help you filter down into the biological space that you care about. And you're actually able as a user to upload your own data into this tool. So you can upload your own list of in vitro activities or your own list of in vivo endpoint data um, to make that comparison. And then the last new tool that I wanna highlight is the chemical characterization tool. Um, so we've worked with Kristen Isaacs and her team to incorporate the EPA's consumer products database. So you can see um, the presence, you can upload a chemical list or select from our many reference chemical lists and look at the presence in consumer products. Um, and then you can also look at things like distribution of physical chemical properties that are either measured or predicted with our OPERA QSAR modeling suite. Um, and then the very last thing that I'll touch upon very quickly, uh, you can't have a presentation during the pandemic without talking about COVID. Um, so we have joined uh, forces with the UK and C3Rs, uh, the Department of Defense um, uh, Chemical Biological Center, NIAID's DMID division and NCATS to form a global working group on microphysiological systems for COVID research. So you can learn more about it on our website. Um, we've, we've had a lot of really successful meetings thus far and shared a lot of really useful information. And there's a couple of specific activities that we're funding through this work group. One is to establish uh, lung on chip technologies at the integrated research facility at NIAID, which up until now has been almost exclusively an animal shop. Um, so they're really pivoting and, and really investing in this tissue chip space and we're helping them with that, which is really exciting. Um, and then we've also funded the development of a COVID-19 uh, disease portal on the microphysiological systems database that is uh, primarily funded through the NCATS tissue chip consortium. So if anybody's interested in joining this working group, uh, we, we would welcome your participation. So um, I will stop there and um, acknowledge our group. This is our pandemic photo, and this is all of their smiling faces. So, thanks. Thank you so much, Nicole. It's exciting stuff, and it's great to see that uh, so many of those boxes are being ticked on the uh, six-pack tests. Uh, Next up, uh, we have uh, Bob Vandervater from Leiden University. We had talked about uh, how we're making the meeting uh, more international. Uh, Bob's been with us for the last several years, uh, and he'll be speaking on uh, EU tox risk and uh, related activities. Bob? Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been speaking in the past years about EU talks risk and 
actually uh, those years go by quickly and uh, we are actually now in, in our six years already so we, we already spent five years in developing basically all the tools and apply these uh, particular NAM approaches uh, with a focus on read across so we're now in our final year um, but i'm happy to tell you that we will continue in another context but i talk about it in the last slide um, so over the past five years we, we have been really establishing a lot of uh, uh, tools uh, so we have various test method description that we have in the knowledge platform we have deposited all our data sets and bio studies run the various case studies uh, including case studies of industry published a lot uh, uh, and also importantly from our case studies had uh, reports that are published by the OECD uh, I, I spent a few words on that later as well um, so it's really a combination of science and uh, working together with uh, SME partners with regulators industries particularly also those case studies and see how we can apply basically these NAMs uh, for application in risk assessment ultimately now dissemination has also been strong over those years um, um, you know in, in sessions I did SOT we've been there in your talks uh, international workshop but importantly also um, train basically the new generation that should continue in this in whatever position they may have in industry or academia or in, in regulatory authorities at some point um, so we have been focused in particular on, on read across in many of those case studies and we had workshops in the past to talk about that so we we have now these meeting reports on these dams and based on these workshop also had uh, um, you know defined um, advisory documents how you can actually apply these new methodologies for read across approaches now we've been reporting on this uh, in the ocd out the case study working group and we have published now this uh, at the ocd website so in total five of those read across, read across case studies where we particularly used um, endpoint essays or reporter essays but what has really been advancing over the past years i mean we we already were working on the uh, high throughput transcriptomics in that context but that's what we had not reported in the reported in these uh, case studies so far so <laughs> these high throughput transcriptomics approach has really uh, evolved quite well so one of the cases that it was that was based on VPO analogs, where we uh, asked the question, you know, can we use transcriptomics now also for biological read across? Uh, to keep it short, I mean, if you look at this picture, you see uh, some nice corresponding gene changes, genes over here, different compounds here, and those response. And clearly, what we can see actually that the mode of action of these uh, analogs that are active in the context of state total responses also show um, this uh, uh, responses at the gene level in a dose, dose res response manner and also related to that same potency that they have on the adverse uh, outcome so clearly illustrating that indeed these high throughput transcriptomics uh, approaches uh, do work now from a, from another perspective perspective where we have less similarity on, on uh, uh, compound structure but on mode of action we applied it in a similar approach on uh, complex one and three inhibitors of the mitochondrial respiratory chain also in these high throughput transcriptomics here developed also ways using co-regulated gene network analysis to to have a, a, a more uh, refined analysis of the uh, um, um, analysis of similar mode of action and also quantified it and lo and behold we can now have uh, quite good correlations between complex one inhibitors with different structure but they clearly have a similar mode of action if you look at uh, um, uh, individual uh, co-regulated gene networks but also then identify that at mode of action at the gene level it, it, you cannot differentiate between complex one and complex three inhibitors so that clearly tells that if you look at the uh, uh, molecular initiation event that may be different that downstream 
you cannot disc discriminate uh, per se uh, at that level of the transcriptional response whether we're dealing with a complex one or a complex uh, three inhibitor. Uh, also here, I mean, at the gene level, you can clearly see that we can pinpoint uh, these similar responses for genes that we identified as uh, biomarkers for, for such a mitochondrial toxicity, and also be able to uh, identify compounds that are strong in the response and compounds that are weak in the response, basically under underscoring the application of the high throughput transcriptomics. Now, the question is, of course, uh, can you apply it now with one cell type and then predict basically all kinds of responses and, and, and are sure that you're doing uh, the, the right thing? And here it re really boils down to the essays that we did on various test systems where we ran uh, sets of compounds, uh, 19 compounds in a dose response, and then also did the high throughput transcriptomics where we can clearly define with what, what, with what type of uh, target cell we, we are working. But if you look at then, uh, the overlap between all these cell types on the mode of action, um, um, where um, you know, here you can see uh, as an example, um, um, the responses between uh, the various compounds over here, and then uh, the gene ontology terms that are activated uh, in the different cell systems, but you can clearly see that, that the patterns are, are not uh, very similar. So basically indicating that uh, with one cell type, you cannot uh, define precisely mode of action that may happen in other cell types. So that is uh, knowledge that we have to take into, into account how we can apply basically the high throughput transcriptomics and be predictive for it first outcome at some point. So uh, we had these read across case studies that we uh, had in the first part of the project about two years ago. We initiated new case studies that had different topics, and we're finalizing now these uh, various case studies that all have a different uh, regulatory context uh, of applications of them, uh, be it that with one or a couple of, uh, of test systems from different targets, you can basically uh, predict the outcomes of completely other target organs. That's what we're looking for. Also uh, um, uh, do priority screening for high concern toxic toxicity profiling. Uh, that's one of the case studies um, uh, and so forth. Uh, we will report on that, of course, in the coming year as well. And, and finalize these case studies in this last year of uh, EOTOXRIS. Now it's not only applying NAMS in case studies, also developing or improving uh, uh, the NAMS. So we are, we are close to finalizing the uh, uh, ADMI for organ chip where we have been using IPS derived uh, differentiated cell types. Uh, as well as in sphero, uh, liver spheroids that we incorporate our one chip. And we're testing now this, this chip in the context of ethnic properties of the chip with uh, specific uh, compounds and look whether we can find all those metabolites. And if we also can find the real um, uh, realistic uh, kinetics of these molecules in such a chip. Also more advanced approaches. I mean, if you have those chip and, and based on IPS cells, you've been building now IPS reporters using CRISPR technology that eventually you can either use in high through, throughput screens with imaging or incorporate the such cell types in, in chips. And we have been expanding over the past year basically the set of reporters uh, uh, that we have built in the autopsies. Also, if you think about the AOPs, where you know AOPs are quite linear, there are particular components that be activated. It's all related to our knowledge about biology, and that is static. Well, in fact, it's not static because science will move forward, and uh, this increased scientific knowledge should also uh, uh, evolve basically uh, on, on how we report these AOPs or what we define as key components or key events in those AOPs. So what we've been doing uh, in this context for uh, one of the AOPs actually uh, uh, set up uh, uh, functional genomic screening approaches 
using as RNA approaches, uh, we're moving now on CRISPR screens as well, where we can now pinpoint basically also genes that are involved in these, uh, in the regulation of these stress pathways in this particular AOP uh, that could also uh, either contribute to the understanding how uh, these networks and AOPs are regulated, but also maybe identify biomarkers that could represent now those uh, AOPs in essence. Now, the EU talks race uh, project comes to an end. Uh, there was a call uh, last year where uh, the consortium applied uh, as well. Um, and in this call that was for 60 million, there was space basically for three projects. So we now have a new project that will start uh, um, 1st of June. It's part of three projects that will uh, co also collaborate in a cluster called uh, ASPIS. Um, and our project is now 23 million. There are a lot of partners that have been EU talks with that continue. We will also continue on our collaborations uh, with our US partners, as well as uh, in, invest in the collaboration with the Japanese partners. But it's, it it's, it's continues to involve academia, research institutes, SMEs, large industries, and importantly, of course, uh, again, the regulators to make sure whatever we do from a scientific basis really connects also to the regulatory sides. Now, the goal here is now to, to really much more move into the direction of Aponicio. So how can we actually apply NAMS, uh, uh, be it in silico combined with in, in, in vitro assays, simple assays and complex assays to really uh, uh, start from scratch and perform a true uh, hazard identification um, on the one hand, but move it really to a full risk assessment. So that's what we're aiming for uh, in this risk hunter project. And we have a clear skeleton of the project where we basically look at ADNI, uh, how do molecules perform? Are they metabolized? Can they cross uh, barriers? Where do they end up with in, in the in vivo situation? Of course, all based on predictions, not really going to in vivo as well as then hazard identification going from screens, from in silico approaches to all the way to uh, human anchoring in advanced model systems. But altogether use all these test systems and see how we can put it together in the next generation risk assessment uh, to basically replace uh, animal experimentation um, and still maintain uh, uh, safety uh, for the human setting. Um, now, we have all those newsletters, so I refer to you to this EU talks risk because I cannot talk about whatever, everything what we do. So please visit it, uh, this website, and you can download all those newsletters. We will continue, of course, also with this in the risk control project. And that's where I want to stop. Bob, thank you so much. I love the human-centric approach and the uh, international cooperation that you're spearheading. Uh, next up is uh, Hajime Kojima from JackFam, the uh, Japanese counterpart to uh, uh, ICFAM, uh, who will be talking about a variety of uh, uh, efforts in Japan that he's involved with. Hajime? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, much. Thank you, much. Oh, uh, just one, please. Maybe uh, if you could increase yeah. the volume a little bit at your end, Hajime, that would be great. Thank you. So, uh, hi, everyone. So, thank you very much for giving the opportunity to make a presentation for uh, Japanese uh, project. Uh, uh, or systemic toxicities. So today's uh, my talk about uh, so AI, IPSC, and MPS project in Japan. So on behalf of Japanese expert and researchers, so I will talk about uh, so Japanese current situation to the, the uh, 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 three project. So uh, today's my talk is a uh, big project uh, on going to MPS uh, whole. PBPK and also AI system and repeat those toxic testing. 
Uh, but uh, now is that uh, we have to 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 continue to to uh, to develop the so uh, norm for reproductive toxicity of ICHS5 and also uh, for in the regarding OECD OECD is that the DRP or to, to developing the so reproductive toxicity and in, in vitro immunotoxicity testing. So for or supported by the ICATA members. Anyway, so, so firstly, that I'll talk about the pharmacological toxicology test of using a human IPS cells. You know that's the ICHF7B that we're discussing that cadmiotoxicity testing. So on the Japanese call is developing a cadmiotoxicity screening using impedance-based assays. The measuring the impedance of IPS cell-derived cadmiocyte, cadmium cadmio mono, monocyte concentration and variability were stable in the real time. So based on the, so this test, we have to, to develop the new test method for uh, evaluating the cadmiocyte toxicities. And also uh, now that to, to Japanese pharmaceutical members and also academia developing a neurotoxic screening using MEA. MEA means a so microelectrodor uh, array system. The spike of iPS cell derived neuron is measured so this system for assessing the convulsive inducing the uh, uh, action by machine learning. So uh, this uh, assay that to, to using the so IPS cells and also AI system and to evaluate the so neurotoxicity screening. You know that so uh, to, to F and OECD ongoing the, the development of neurotoxicity screening assays. I think that this also uh, method is uh, uh, very useful to the, to the, uh, the DNT. And you say, so you, but so I, you know, the, so uh, the limited of the IPS cells uh, to the uh, to, uh, screening uh, for pharmaceutical and also to de develop that to, to uh, assessing that to, to pharmaceutical. So uh, Japanese, it's a made project ongoing to develop a, a organ on chip system by mounting organ cells derived from IPS or other stem cell on chip and the device can be applied for safety and pharmaceutical to the uh, and the process of the drug discoveries. So uh, chip and the other device with mounted organ cells and the small intensity and liver kidney, kidney and BBB. So we have to, to, to my colleagues are developing the small intensity and the liver kidney so to very, uh, very so useful. However, that uh, it's difficult to, to develop the kidney and also BBB. So uh, we have to, to develop the, uh, is a first step is the so liver, liver and intensities. Anyway, so to, until now, so this project is a, to, to, uh, is a uh, five years project the, uh, this year is the final the final years. So uh, until now, the so Japanese Korea developed the four or devices developed in Japan. Uh, so uh, such as the liver and on intensity, and also kid, uh, kidney model. And also to my colleagues that developed the analysis equi equipment developed in Japan. So combined with, and, and using the two MPS device and the quick equip, equipment, so user consortium among the pharmaceutical research and suppliers, academia, the, is ongoing the training and, and collaboration of the to develop the uh, uh, new method. So contributing the, to improving the access to MPS based on the stem cell evaluation technology research association. So. Uh, or in the future, we have to, to collaborate with the so to whole regulatory use using the MPS. And also or to, to, to develop the, I'll talk about the so to development in silico hazard prediction system using AI technology for or repeat those toxic testing. So Japanese regulate, regulate us to request the data of the to, to 28 days repeat those toxic testing for chemical regulation. So uh, regarding the uh, METI, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, Poinsment project, 
development of AI based on next generation of safety prediction system using related big data. Big data means that to, to his data based on the, uh, and also uh, reach and also, also Cosmos database uh, to, to evaluate the so in vitro system. Uh, Toxcas, Tox, uh, Tox21 data, and also to, to Japanese original data. So, uh, so using that to, to Adome uh, system, PBPK model, and also to in vitro data, and also to in silico data, uh, to compare with the, uh, to combine also to the all data to, to evaluate the, to, to in vivo data. So, uh, but so uh, this uh, until now is that to, to uh, 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 almost cases that so hazard identification of uh, indeed across and in silico. So uh, it's important is the PBPKs comparison of dynamic simulation and the measured value using a lot and pharmacokinetics determination. Uh, left side uh, figure is that to log AUC in plasma or in vivo data. And so uh, 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 compared to, to the in silico derived pharmaceutical pharm uh, developed parameters, very good so correlation. So uh, using the, so this uh, PBBK model, we have to, to fix that to, to, to uh, Adame and also to do using the, this database to, 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 to evaluate this to, to, to uh, repeat those statistic testing uh, using in silico data and AI. So, uh, you know, the so translation research science using advanced technology. Original technology is that uh, limited regulation. Advanced technology not much the so railways. So it's necessary for new technology to optimize regulations based on the international harmonization with industries, government and industries. So very important so to role of the stakeholders so uh, and also to the, uh, also to co in collaboration to, to the international harmonization, international collab communication. So Japan has a long history and many experiments regarding the alternative method of developing. But so I think the important is to in order to the accelerate the archive of new approach method for systematic toxicology in every regulatory field, such as chemicals, pharmaceutical. Pharmac shoot card and food. We need international cooperation and so communication with a partner who are sharing the common goal for regulatory use. I think so to, to very into uh, welcome to the collaboration and communication with so to, to, to uh, a lot of so countries so to development of a new method. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Hajime. Uh, it's it's uh, great to see the collaborations with the OECD, who's in a position to make things happen internationally. Um, Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll move along in the program. I I would note that uh, we're seriously um, behind schedule in that we're almost in danger of uh, wiping out the entire discussion uh, session if, um, if the current pace keeps up. So if there's anything that the remaining speakers can do to uh, save some discussion time, that would be appreciated. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Thomas Hotrung with uh, Johns Hopkins CAT, who will be giving an update on CAT activities. Thomas? Sorry, I had to unmute myself before sharing. <laughs> it does not show the sharing button. Hello, everyone. Um, let me come to screen sharing again. Um, is it? Yeah. Okay. Good. 
So. Thomas, we are actually seeing your entire desktop. There you go. That's, that's fine. Okay, good. So, yep. oops. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, when we started this series in 2009, um, uh, this is meant to not talk about what we achieved in the past and what you have heard in other presentations, but it is about to talk uh, about what is in its making. Um, so in order to bring the family together of organizations and projects which are trying to change toxicology, and uh, it is, is not strictly on alternative methods, it's about improving the science here. And what has been in its making also for almost 40 years is our center. We're going to celebrate on the 40, uh, in September this year our 40th birthday, and please stay tuned on what we're going to do for this. Um, we are well aware that after some 15 months in, uh, in a pandemic, there is a considerable Zoom fatigue, but we also really appreciate the increased outreach, which we are able to achieve, for example, with this event today, which has almost twice as many participants as we typically achieve at an, as an SOT, um, uh, SOT satellite. Um, a lot of our things have moved to online. Um, we have seen an enormous uptake of our uh, online teaching. Uh, almost 12,000 people have uh, uh, taken our courses on Coursera, which are available for free. Um, with three times more signing up every uh, week um, now since the pandemic started. But we also started working now on online workshops, um, something we could not imagine in the past when our in-presence workshops, of which we held more than 40 in the last 10 years uh, in the context of the transatlantic think tank for toxicology, they are now moving online. The first one was just last week on developmental immunotoxicity and we'll come back to this, uh, but we have one in preparation um, so if you're interested, please let me know. Um, it will be on dog use for pesticides. And you can see uh, that we have some major stakeholders in the steering group organizing uh, this workshop. Uh, one of the biggest thing uh, we are doing at the moment is preparing for um, a World Summit on Microphysiological Systems, which we hope to organize uh, end of May, early June next year in New Orleans. More than 35 organizations worldwide have joined us and um, a very impressive scientific advisory committee has formed and been formed in addition. Uh, so we hope to really use this to create a series of conferences and an international society. Uh, I also would like to alert you that at this moment, uh, a call is open for the world conference series in um, uh, alternative methods, a series which we also started in 1983, um, 1993, sorry, uh, which was actually um, starting in Baltimore and for which we hope to find a new organizer in two years time. Uh, again, please contact me if there's any interest. A strong interest of ours uh, has been developmental problems, especially developmental neurotoxicity. But as I already mentioned, uh, in the context of a newly started program on developmental immunotoxicity, uh, which Fenacilli in the middle here is, is heading, um, uh, we just carried out a first completely online workshop. Uh, so please stay tuned. We are trying to develop a larger program for many years to come on developmental immunotoxicity. And you will see in the next few weeks an announcement that we are actually going, trying to fill a professorship associated with the center um, paid from philanthropic money, which will be on alternatives to developmental and reproductive toxicity. It has just been cleared from the side of Hopkins. Uh, developmental neurotox has been um, our work since 2005, when I teamed up at, at the time at ECWAM uh, with Alan Goldberg at CAT. And uh, over the time, we have uh, planned and executed five um, international conferences. The last one, uh, DNT5, was foreseen for April uh, last year, had to be postponed, and we now hope with light at the end of the tunnel to have DNT5 soon coming to, uh, in, into, into uh, seeing the light of the day. Uh, we also have done nine workshops. These are only two examples uh, on the context of DNT uh, many of, uh, of them led to major publications and have influenced processes at EFSA 
um, at the OECD and at the most recently at FIFRA. And I would like to mention especially the long lasting collaboration here with the EPA. So DNT5, uh, stay tuned. This is something which is uh, going to be revised in its makeup, but uh, is on our agenda. Uh, in this context, uh, we are just received news that environmental health perspectives has taken um, one of our major papers in the context of DNT, which will be describing uh, an example how gene environment interaction can be done using microphysiological systems by entering a risk gene for DNT and combining it with a substance which is known to have hazards for, uh, for developmental uh, neurotoxicity. We can show synergy between uh, the genetics and the environment. And I think this is a very interesting way forward for studying gene environment interaction in microphysiological human systems. Um, a long quest of ours was into the quality assurance of um, cell culture systems. And this started with good cell culture practice 1.0, which we published in 2005 out of ECWAM and which has now been um, furthered into Good Cell Culture Practice 2.0. The draft published last year has received 350 comments from stakeholders and we are in the uh, ultimate process of incorporating these and voting on those uh, where we cannot find uh, easy agreement. So still a process ongoing, which will lead then to implementation of GCP 2.0. Uh, there's a lot around the quest, uh, uh, activities around uh, the quality of actual testing. Uh, one of them is the test readiness criteria, which uh, my partner in CAD Europe, Marcel Leist, did spearhead uh, developing test readiness criteria here for the example of development and neurotoxicity. But we're also moving forward um, with reporting standards. Um, we have had two publications in 2019 on these reporting standards, this is ongoing work to try to identify how to describe properly in vitro systems in order to make them reproducible. So this is again an activity uh, which is ongoing and for which we still are interested in taking up additional partners to develop these uh, criteria. And you will also hear from um, uh, Katja Tsayun in, uh, uh, in, in a few minutes about our ongoing activities on evidence integration. Five workshops have been done also in collaboration with Dan Krusko, who's going to talk, to talk later uh, and his Risk Science Institute um, in Ottawa. Uh, EFSA um, was a partner to the evidence-based toxicology collaboration here, uh, an important aspect of really dealing well with high quality of information. Um, the last point I would like to make is about artificial intelligence, uh, which is for me making big sense of big data. Um, this is a topic for us for the last six, seven years. Um, what you can see here, first of all, is that uh, the um, journal um, Frontiers in Artificial Intelligence, which I helped to launch and where I'm the field chief editor, um, has published in a bit more than two years now, more than 200 articles and has just been accepted in uh, PubMed, uh, so it is uh, in record time uh, going into this important uh, indexing. And you can see we, we have really a very nice um, edit, uh, editorial board here shown for the section of medicine public health, uh, which is the one uh, we kicked off. Um, Alex Merton and her team, uh, her PhD students seen here to the right, they continue publishing on uh, essentially making sense of big data sets, especially from omics technologies. You see some of the papers which have come out um, in the last uh, two months. There's one paper which will be actually published tomorrow, uh, which continues our work on studying MCF7 cells and how little they actually show as a cell, cell line uh, for human cancer um, in frontiers in artificial intelligence. And some of the others are uh, at the moment out uh, in uh, either already published or being published in, uh, most, uh, in the most uh, near, in the nearest future. The last point in this context, I would like to alert you that not only Risk Hunter, the successor of Utox Risk, is going to start as we heard from Bob van der Water, but we actually started on 1st of May a consortium which is called Ontox, which is coordinated by Mathieu Winken from the Free University 
uh, in Brussels, uh, a $20 million project with 18 partners. Um, I'm responsible for the AI part of this project. Uh, and beside our group here in the US, um, the spin-off company Toxtrack from our former PhD student, Tom Lüchtefeld, and Alta Tox, who's running our EU policy program, are involved in this project. So this is finally giving us the opportunity to pursue um, the read across based structure activity relationship, um, our contribution to AI in toxicology into um, a broader field. And with this, I hope I rushed you to some of the activities. This is all meant as an invitation to join in and collaborate. And I hope to be contacted by uh, many of you in the audience. Thanks a lot. Thomas, thanks so much. Uh, and Thomas mentioned Katja Sayun. Uh, she will be uh, our next speaker. She's also a colleague at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and she'll be talking about the evidence-based toxicology collaboration, giving us the EBTC update. Gotcha. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Hello, uh, it's a pleasure pleasure to be here. Thank you, uh, Marley, for inviting me to speak. So uh, do you see my slides? Uh, uh, presentation mode for us. Okay, I did and it undid it. It's not a big deal. Okay. Yeah. If you see your presenter um, screen, just uh, switch display. Great. Uh, now switch display. Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay. Great. Uh, so EBTC, most of you are familiar with it. So we're uh, working on bringing together the international toxicology community to adopt uh, the evidence-based uh, methodologies in the field of toxicology. So what are our objectives? Uh, we are promoting high-quality, high-impact research in toxicology and environmental health. And our major themes are uh, depicted here. So we are trying to raise research standards, uh, making sense of evidence, improving access to research, and advocating evidence-based decision-making. So first uh, about our funding. So majority of our funding comes from CUT. Um, and we, we also have received some funding, including in-kind contributions from the listed organizations. And there's a lot of organizations that help us complete our projects without which it wouldn't be happening. So very thankful for that. So uh, here are some of the examples of what we do. So uh, the example of applying systematic methods to development of adverse outcome pathways or AOPs, that's our newest uh, theme that has appeared in the last uh, uh, two years with a couple of workshops uh, with uh, Grade and Hamilton. That report just came out, as you can see here in Altex, and then uh, Parma with uh, EFSA, European Food Safety Authorities. And that's work that's uh, continuing in a variety of new projects uh, and also at OECD level. The recommendations for good practice in toxicology systematic reviews. Uh, using systematic reviews uh, to evaluate non-animal test methods uh, for drug-induced liver injury. That's the project that I'm going to tell you in a little bit more depth. And uh, coming soon, watch out for uh, the updated definition of biological plausibility that's going to come out in the next, uh, next month or so. So these are some of our historical projects that they traditionally have fallen into two buckets, the methodologies, uh, evidence-based methodologies, and practical applications of systematic reviews. You'll be happy to know that you'll never hear about zebrafish test uh, again, for those of you who have been involved in it for a long time, because it is now under the final systematic review is now under review in toxicological sciences. We hope to let this fish out of the, out in the open. Finally, so there is a number of uh, new projects uh, that have been uh, have actually started uh, in uh, 
last year or just before the pandemic year. And most of them, as you can see, actually pretty much all of them are in collaboration uh, or part of bigger projects and with other organizations such as WHO, OECD, EFSA, European Commission. So what I'm going to tell you a little bit about is about our, it's our internal lingo, we call it TOX21 project, but it essentially on trying to see how the systematic literature review could be used to, uh, to provide the evidence for test methods comparison. So we, uh, as I mentioned, we just published uh, this, uh, this paper on two drugs, on uh, troglitazone and, and rosiglitazone and comparison of three evidence streams the in, uh, in vivo evidence that's published in, in the literature, in the open literature from uh, preclinical animal models and human, um, human studies, the TOXCAST, TOX21 data, in vitro mechanistic evidence, and the real world evidence from pharmacovigilance databases. So that's, uh, that's the structure of the study. So we use three evidence streams and we use the evidence-based assessment of systematic literature review, the full review for in vivo studies. And again, this was done in a, a very close collaboration with Norwegian, Norwegian Institute of Public Health and with a number of partners uh, also participating, including USFDA National Center for uh, Computational Research. So um, the study was focused on two drugs, troglitazone and rosiglitazone, and was focused specifically on drug-induced liver injury. Troglitazone, as you all know, has been withdrawn uh, by FDA after a signal uh, from uh, severe liver injury and deaths uh, appeared within the first uh, few months after releasing it to the market. Rosiglitazone has other issues. But in terms of the liver, uh, liver tox, it uh, doesn't have the severity of the um, of theory and is still on the market. So what we found after we reviewed uh, using systematic approach uh, over 9,000 records from multiple databases, we found 42 studies that were eligible for, uh, for analysis. And uh, what we found essentially is that uh, we didn't see a strong signal in uh, difference between troglitazone and rosiglitazone. We did see a signal in uh, non-human primates, actually in the liver weight, which interestingly was not uh, reported as a significant finding. So that's an aside. So what, uh, what we found, there are significant limitations in the published uh, uh, literature. There's a significant publication bias the regulatory preclinical and clinical studies that have been submitted to FDA are actually typically not published. They're, they're considered confidential sponsor information. So the FDA and other regulatory agencies really need to work on something creative um, to motivate the sponsors to make these studies approval, or they can just tell them to do so. Um, the publication quality is certainly is, uh, is a problem. So there's a frequently lack of detailed protocols, lack of individual animal data, uh, insufficient details in the method section and the selective reporting. The, we conducted the full risk of bias analysis of these studies and there, there certainly is, there is a room for improvement. In terms of the publication standards, there is lack of standard uh, structured abstracts, which makes the review process um, longer than it should be. What uh, was exciting, what we found is that the TOXCAST in vitro data, which we've taken directly from the TOXCAST database, actually has shown the difference between rosiglitazone and troglitazone significant. So we saw, uh, if you see on the right, uh, the, uh, the number of tests in which uh, troglitazone showed activity were twice as many tests compared to rosiglitazone. So when we analyzed uh, this data, we saw that uh, troglitazone taking only, only uh, tests in which uh, both compounds were tested, troglitazone was positive in seven times more TOXCAS tests compared to rosiglitazone. So that is significant information that could have been used prior to uh, clinical trials and prior to exposing uh, patients unnecessarily to dangerous, dangerous compounds. 
So that's the key message of the paper. So there are limitations in Toxica's data set, and I appreciate that uh, EPA continues working on it. And I just heard this morning about some improvements. We certainly haven't uh, used the database version that's live right now that uh, I think is addressing some of these issues. So what we've learned uh, is I already mentioned the publication bias and a lack of published regulatory animal tox studies is a problem. So you are, so what's the purpose of doing systematic literature review if you don't have the complete data, right? So uh, in the ToxCast uh, also there is a limited set of assays that was subjectively selected around 2005. Uh, there is, uh, we found that there was a varied AC50 cal calculations depending on the assay and not always uh, clear how it was done. Uh, and there's also some missing data. So, um, but the key, uh, key message that I want to leave you with is that regulatory agencies need to find ways to work with sponsors on submitted data transparency and open science. So that's a little bit about the GRC-led project uh, called CHOW, uh, which is a modeling of the pathogenesis of COVID-19 using AOP frameworks, where uh, we are supervising the methodology uh, for a systematic scoping review of neurological effects of COVID-19 and collaborating with Helena Hochberg on this from, from CAD. And we are <clears throat> working on uh, the protocol now for scoping review with participation of AOP community. There's a number of uh, training sessions that uh, we provided for AOP community. So uh, who is running the project? So there's uh, currently uh, three of us. Uh, there's Paul uh, Whaley at, uh, in the UK and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Sebastian Hoffman <laughs> from, from Germany, I apologize. Uh, so please, uh, uh, join the collaboration. There is all the data that we publish is available publicly. So if you want to have access for anything or uh, collaborate on anything that we've put out and have different ways of analyzing data, we're happy to, uh, to work with you and uh, provide you even more information that we already uh, have. Now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katya. Uh, moving on, uh, next we'll hear from uh, Kate Willett from the uh, Humane Society International uh, speaking on behalf of the uh, Animal Free Safety Assessment Collaboration, which she'll tell us more about. Kate. Hi, Marty. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. It's really great to see so many people here, even though I very much miss seeing all of you in person. Um, there's definite benefits to the virtual and also de definite limitations to the virtual format, but thank you all for joining us today. So today I'm going to try to briefly tell you about um, a relatively new project that we have on um, an education and training program on uh, animal free safety assessment of uh, cosmetics in particular, but the this will apply to other types of substances as well. Um, let me know, is this working? Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, uh, in 2019, um, the Humane Society International, we put all of our toxicology related projects under one umbrella, which we're calling the Animal Free Safety Assessment Collaboration. And um, we have four current projects right now on different types of substances and, and materials, but the one I'm going to focus on today is on cosmetics. This project has two pieces to it. One is a policy piece, which is really working on a global alignment with the EU situation of the prohibition on testing and sales of cosmetics that have been tested on animals. Um, in major economies around the world, and that is progressing um, quite well. The point there is that the future of cosmetics and personal care products is um, non-animal. So to make that practical, we have also engaged uh, the creation of what we're calling an education and training program on exactly how to do this. And, and the methodologies will be familiar to, to all of you um, the groups that are the group that is working on this are our partners, 
And many of these um, partners are uh, the, the global experts leading the edge on development of these methods and implementation of these methods in, in the regulatory realm. So this project, as I mentioned, is really designed to support innovation without new animal testing. And the process, of course, is risk-based. Um, and it's also exposure-led because of the, the nature of cosmetics. And um, it's product and use specific. And it is really based on an iterative assessment um, design. Um, and critically for this program, uh, it's based on sharing case examples with all, from all of our partners. And um, the idea here is to create a program that is, uh, it's our major stakeholders are the regulated and regulatory communities globally, anyone that needs to um, either create or assess risk assessment of cosmetics. Um, so it would be CROs as well and other stakeholders um, in, in different um, geographic areas. Um, this, this slide is just emphasizing that this program is based on well-established principles and processes. Uh, the first one being the, the um, International Cooperation on Cosmetics Regulation Principles. There are nine principles that govern a good assessment process. And the Surat Workflow, which is a, a framework program um, a, a number of years ago um, that is, uh, was, was designing a way of doing um, non-animal assessments in a three-tiered process. And um, the three tiers are just uh, collecting existing information, evaluating that, and then um, looking at any of your in silico tools, predictive models, anything um, that would be available uh, to provide more information for this dust safety assessment. And if necessary, then you create an ab initio um, in vitro based assessment um, strategy to get further information um, to, to answer your, your regulatory question. So our program is based on this very well, pretty well accepted and vetted processes and um, just outlined grossly here on this slide, um, the, the risk assessment process is in blue. And then our program has been divided. We've divided this project up into what we're calling modules that are kind of um, their bite-sized chunks of this process that really rely on specific expertise. So the way we're developing this is we have teams of people developing each one of these modules. And um, the modules overall are all together will cover the entire risk assessment process. And the next few slides are just, uh, I'm not gonna go through them in detail, um, but I wanted to have them there if you know these slides will be available to you afterward and you can go back and look to see what each of the modules cover. But basically um, I'll just describe them very briefly right now. So we have two modules that cover the, the initial setup of you know, you gather all the existing information and you assess that to see if you can answer your question. And uh, we have one module on problem formulation. So how you set that all up. Another module on history of safe use. So if you're using botanicals, how can you address that question without the need for, for um, additional information? Um, and then there are two modules that, that cover the exposure piece. And one is a module on consumer exposure and how you do that, what information goes into it, where do you find that information? And then another module on exposure-based waving, um, uh, different types of exposure-based waving that are applicable to um, cosmetics. And then um, if you need bi biological activity information, um, there are two modules covering that predictive chemistry. So all your uh, in silico tools, uh, SAR, QSARs, um, this is where read across, you would find uh, information on read across. Um, and then in vitro assay synthesis. Now, critically, this module, all of this entire program is about how to use the information, not really how to generate the information. So this is not how to do the in vitro assays, but how to use the information from the in vitro assays to make decisions. Um, and uh, so, so that will give you sort of your, your point of departure information. And then if you, um, if you need further refinement, you know, if your exposure and your activity are too close together, for example, 
Um, there's a module on exposure refinement. So this is the internal exposure. So um, this is your PPK mod PBK modeling and uh, IVIVE, things like that are covered in this module. And then finally, how do you wrap all this information together um, to address the uh, risk assessment question that you have from your problem formulation? So again, these slides, they grossly outline what is in each module. And I don't have time to go through this. So I'm just going to leave this here for you to visit later on. Um, sorry about the transition. Uh, <laughs> um, and then I'll just point out here. So we're developing these modules. Um, as teams of scientists. So these are the experts that really know this stuff, in some cases develop the methodology. Um, and they're providing the content and the case examples for each one of these steps. We are uh, integrating an education expert to help us with the educational design because as scientists, we're not really that great at that. So these are all designed around learning objectives that will allow us to also have a, a assessment tools like quizzes and exams and such. Um, and then we have a graphic designer who's going to help us make everything look very nice and be presentable. The idea is to eventually um, get this online um, as a you know, available course that one can then take, because all of these modules, as you can imagine, are quite long. And uh, they're also, unfortunately, sort of coming online at different times, just based on how long it's taking to, to create each one. So our, our plan right now is uh, we're developing the modules. We're beginning to uh, set up these discussions. And this is kind of what I want to emphasize right now, is that um, we're beginning discussions with uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, people who are interested in this project, um, from our stakeholder populations to get initial feedback on these drafts. So right now we're considering these drafts. We want to have conversations with people um, to get initial feedback, and then we'll revise the modules over the next few months before we actually solidify them into a course. So if any of you who are on the phone right now um, uh, and want to provide feedback to any of these modules, please get in touch with me because we'll be doing that over the next few months. Um, okay, and that's really it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kate. And uh, as I said in the uh, introduction, uh, Kate is the uh, co-host and co-organizer of this event and has been for several years. Thanks for your efforts, Kate. Um, our uh, last speaker, last but not least, and, and uh, perhaps appropriate that we hear from uh, Dan Kruski, uh, who was the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the chairperson of the National Academies Committee that produced the TT21C report in 2007. So Dan, uh, 14 or so years later, uh, you're your uh, presentation, please. Uh, thanks very much, Marty. It's really <clears throat> exciting to be at this stage 14 or so years later. You were there at the birth of TT21C very much appreciated your <clears throat> contributions to that effort. But I will try and be fairly brief um, and just indicate these are the uh, five um, points that I want to touch on. And the first one, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on because we've heard tremendous progress from all of the speakers today. Uh, this is a uh, review that we published last year on our perspective on what's happened since 2007. And you'll find a quote in the paper that the progress to date has basically exceeded my expectations. Uh, and another thing you might like about this paper, there's an online appendix with all kinds of data resources, analytic tools that you can look to see how to do some of the uh, types of analyses that we talked about today. Another activity that I'm currently involved in is a series of workshops that started out focusing on evidence-based risk assessment 
using new types of data. It's kind of shifted slightly into evidence integration. Um, we had a mini workshop just in 2020 in December, which we're postponing the final workshop, which is on case studies, because I want to have that in person. And workshop 3B at the bottom says 2021-2022. I'm not scheduling this workshop and, until we can do it in person. This is too good a trio of workshops that we've organized together with, uh, with Thomas and, and Kat uh, over the last three years. Uh, you will see uh, when we start getting the results of these workshops out, a framework for evidence integration, which uh, the actual workshop reports are going to go into each of the components in some detail. So there should be a series of uh, three major reports when we're all done, uh, culminating with the, the case studies and how they play out in this kind of a framework. Uh, also been looking at some case studies outside of the workshop process. I'm not going to um, dwell on this slide because you've heard lots of examples of how new approach methodologies are being used in risk assessment. But here's a series of case studies that uh, we've been looking at and actually uh, trying to draw some lessons learned about what works well when we bring uh, NAMs into the risk assessment uh, world. Also looking at how we can organize NAMs in some uh, structured way, been working with Health Canada to try and figure out if there's a uh, tiered structured systematic approach. So this is an adaptation of um, a paper by Mel Anderson in Altex. We've been working with Mel on uh, um, evolving this a little bit further. So you'll see different levels of NAMs with <clears throat> increasing complexity being applied to uh, different types of issues, all of which <clears throat> will help contribute to characterization of population health risks. Um, one of the uh, exciting things that we've done over the last couple of years has been to work with EPA. And we've actually developed, um, this is still just sort of in final form, so I'm not going to show any detailed results, but I'll tell you what we found. We've developed a value of information framework that looks at if we looked at different types of toxicity, toxicity testing strategies that vary with the level of certainty in the results, how long they take, and how much they cost. Uh, we have a very detailed analytical framework, which is quite novel. It brings in costs associated with delay. It looks at uh, public health risks and benefits. It looks at different decision-making styles. But the, the general uh, conclusion that's emerging from a very in-depth series of analyses is that the timeliness of informa information collection is quite important in driving return on investment. And it looks like that getting reasonably certain data earlier uh, can be uh, better uh, in terms of overall public health benefit than getting more precise information that you have to wait quite a bit longer for. So we should have um, a couple of papers on this ready to show you uh, probably within the next few months. <clears throat> and my final point is this sort of touches on evidence integration and these uh, key characteristics of uh, toxic substances which started with key characteristics of carcinogens. And I'm showing you the 2019 update to the IARC pre preamble to the monographs, which emphasizes a number of things, um, systematic review, including systematic review of the key char characteristics which drive the mechanistic evaluations. <clears throat> and there's a very nice evidence integration uh, uh, description linking um, human, animal, and, and mechanistic evidence. But the key characteristics, um, we've done some work on key characteristics of carcinogens, looking at every agent that's in group one of the IARC monographs, observing that 85 out of 86 that we evaluated show evidence of genotoxicity. And you can see the frequency with which the other key characteristics are exhibited. These are summarized in a volume published by, by the agency um, in 2019. And uh, since then, there has been work on key characteristics of reproductive toxicants, acute toxicants, ongoing work on repeat dose toxicants. So my hope is that being able to identify key characteristics of toxic substances 
will actually help us in understanding human risk better. And NAMS can certainly feed into the identification of these key characteristics. So my final slide is just to repeat my opening slide, which tells you, uh, uh, just as a reminder, my five, five key messages on things that I'm uh, focusing on right now. All finished, Marty. Hope I didn't take too long. Not at all, Dan. I, I appreciate you streamlining that presentation. And um, uh, we'll now shift into a discussion period. Of course, it'll be uh, quite abbreviated. And, um, but we still have uh, the faithful uh, online, uh, 140 participants or so, although the number is uh, declining as, as the, the webinar approaches. Um, uh, uh, Dana, uh, uh, it looks like people have um, not really used the chat box um, that much. Uh, and uh, those that have, um, their concerns um, have kind of been addressed by uh, uh, other folks uh, commenting. So we can just kind of do it uh, live in the moment. And uh, Dan, I'm wondering if you could just, uh, I want to ask you and uh, Andrew Rowan, if he's still uh, online, just to uh, you know, step back and give your thoughts on uh, where we are on shifting the paradigm and um, uh, putting, uh, putting animals behind us. Um, I, I've, I've answered that question in detail in our last year's Archives of Toxicology paper. Short story is I think the, the, the progress has been tremendous. We're seeing real world applications. This meeting is really, really satisfying to see all of the um, terrific science that uh, uh, has been accomplished in the last 14 years. I think we're headed very much in the right direction, but I'd be interested to see if Andrew has uh, similar views. I, I most certainly do. Um, I've uh, just listening to the presentations today, it's just extraordinary what's happening. I mean, I go back to 1976 and uh, an early discussion at the Home Office about the LD50 test, and I was presenting a paper saying that they should do away with the LD50 test. And, and one of the technical uh, advisors was a toxicologist from the north of London, uh, north of England, who said, but we can't do away with the LD50 test. It's the fundamental basis on all to for all toxicology. And uh, hearing, uh, you know, Nicole talking about looking at a way to sort of replace the LD50 uh, in vivo, um, I mean, it, it's just extraordinary what's been happening. And uh, the last 10, 15 years since the celebrated um, NAS report um, that Dan chaired, uh, I mean, it's just uh, the, the progress has been remarkable. And I commented about the reduction in animal use um, that the British figures show. Um, and the, the pharmaceutical industry has increased their R&D expenditure in real terms in Britain. Uh, but they've, their actual use of animals has dropped by 75%. Whereas in the, um, in the uh, biomedical laboratories in the universities and medical school laboratories, uh, animal use stays pretty much, has stayed pretty much the same for the last 20, 30 years. So the, the, the developments are occurring in this space, in the animal testing and, and also in the drug development arena. It's very interesting what's happening there. And when you have the head of NIH saying that he predicts that drug testing and develop, drug development and testing will be done in vitro in, by 2026, in, uh, testifying in front of the Senate panel, I mean, it's, it is just extraordinary the change that has, has happened. And I've just been I'm privileged to be, have been a small sideline part of what's been going on. The scientists the, in the presentation here are the ones who are making the real change. I was... I'd be more of just a commentator. I should add that uh, Andrew is the chair of the uh, CAT uh, advisory board, as well as being uh, the head of uh, Wellbeing International. 
I wonder if uh, if Charu is still uh, online and would like to um, comment. Uh, apparently not. How about uh, Bernard Robert? Is, is he, uh, he's a long time observer of this field. Is Bernard uh, online still? No? Uh, okay. F Fran Krzyzewski? Fran, are you online? Oh, people are dropping fast. Sue Leary? I'm here, Hi. Mark. I'm hey. Here. <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah, good, good. Would you uh, would you like to comment, Sue? I mean, you're a longtime observer in the field from the uh, the policy perspective. Yeah, thank you. I I actually uh, I I agree with everything Andrew said. It's a, a very exciting time, and I was making notes because, um, as you know. Uh, uh, not not a secret, I don't think, to some of these folks, but, you know, there are some authors looking back at uh, what what was written in, 19, in 1976 about uh, animal testing at that time, and it's a, definitely a, a moment to make a note of how things have changed so much for the positive while animal use is still obviously very uh, popular in university labs. But our, our foundation you know, is trying uh, to uh, help with that. We have our grant program. And in fact, we're looking at uh, dozens of grants right now, uh, applications that have come in. Um, and we continue to uh, fund at the university bench level. Uh, and there's a lot of interest in the on a chip uh, technologies. So I, I think it's going to continue to grow in the biomedical research space as well. And uh, perhaps just uh, anyone else would like to comment, uh, just taking a step back and looking at the field or whatever you'd like to say. I don't want to necessarily dictate who talks and who doesn't. M Marty, not, not looking back, but maybe looking forward, there were a couple of comments by presenters about COVID-19. And I'm wondering if anybody has any thoughts about how some of the new science might help us uh, deal not just with the current pandemic, but with uh, future infectious agents that we will undoubtedly be confronted with down the road. Good point. And I'm happy to comment on this uh, because I mean, we have seen some miracles last year. Uh, if, if you think that uh, vaccine development typically takes 10.7 years on average, uh, drug development 12 years, and we have seen nine vaccines in different parts of the world being uh, developed and accepted and used, and uh, several drugs in, uh, already uh, came into use. Uh, and these miracles were possible because we largely skipped the animal experiments because otherwise we would not yet even be in, in, in humans if, if any of this had taken place. I don't say that we should make this the new standard, uh, but we can obviously um, shortcut here. And the new models have served. Um, we have seen already in March last year the first um, descriptions of COVID-19 in lung on ship models. Uh, so this is really remarkable. We have used our mini brains for showing that human neurons can be infected with COVID-19. Um, this is something you could not do in any animal test because there is no animal model where these organ um, um, manifestations have been shown. And Nicole is organizing uh, something really important at the moment to show the efficiency of these models. Katya is involved in the European uh, counterpart for AOPs for COVID-19. Um, this is uh, opening the door. And, uh, we must use it. We must take advantage of this. Anyone else on that subject? 
Well, I'd just like to comment on what Dan said about the timing uh, and how it was more important to get the data out quickly than to get a, a more precise data out, you know, in a year or a year later. And I think that's what's been seeing with the uh, with the COVID experience is that um, yeah, the vaccines had a few problems, but by comparison with uh, what COVID does to people, the vaccines are far far less dangerous th than the uh, than the virus. And you know, it's it's really interesting to see the different approach that regulators have taken in Europe versus the uh, United States. And I think you know it's it's a it's an issue here the the sort of very cautious, very safe at all costs le, uh, approach that we have here in the United States versus the way Britain approached it, I think it is an interesting example of what we should be talking about. And the animal stuff, uh, as Thomas points out, takes a long time to do, and it, it's one of the major reasons why um, the drug development is uh, is so lengthy. But it's also one of the, I suspect it's also a reason why potential drugs fail, as Thomas has pointed out over the years, is that uh, we wouldn't have aspirin today if it had to go through the process that, uh, the regulatory process that um, uh, we currently have. Andrew, uh, just very quickly, Marty, I'm, I'm really excited to show the world our VLI results because it is a uh, very big effort that we put into this over the last couple of years. And they're going to be very, very informative in giving you a sense of what types of toxicity strategy, testing strategies. And Marine has involved, been involved with this uh, as part of the EPA collaboration under which we did this work. What types of toxicity testing strategies are going to do the most good for the most people? So we should have a couple of papers, as I said, uh, ready for public release in the next couple of months. So, sorry for the shameless self-promotion, Maureen. Uh, no worries, no. I'll just ride your coattails, it's fine. <laughs> uh, not at all, Dan. Um, uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, Thomas, any, uh, any last words? Can't hear you, you're muted. I saw that Bernard is finally unmuted and yet called on him earlier. So perhaps we give him a slot at least. Yes, yes. please, Bernard. Sure, uh, it's been a remarkable transition over the last, I've been on the CAD board since 1988. The transition has been amazing. The progress we saw today was amazing. However, I think there's still a lot of resistance within the academic community and within the regulatory agencies, some regulatory agencies to move forward. And until we validate more tests that are really better value than some of the animal tests, we won't be able to get there. So much more research and particularly more funding by government agencies such as uh, CIHR or NIH, it is very hard to get grants funded in this area. Some of us are successful at it, but by and large, it is a real challenge. So I will leave it with that. Okay. Thank you. Marty, I take the offer of uh, saying a, a, a last word. Uh, I think we have shown once again that alternatives are our strength. In this case, we choose an alternative format to what we are doing annually at the SOT. And I think it was a success um, owed to the format. We had less time, we had less interactions, but we had much more people. And uh, I think we have, you have seen an incredible portfolio of activities. Uh, as Bernard just reminded us, it is a continuing uphill battle. Um, I'm now about 30 years in this field. Uh, I've seen that my claim to fame, a pyrogen test, only after 25 years now is suddenly to start reducing animal numbers in Europe. Uh, so don't expect anything much faster for the things we are, have been developing since the uh, Hallmark report from 2007. But we're on the way. We're on the way, as everybody can see. Uh, I think the family comes closer with every of these meetings. Um, and I'm looking forward to the next one in person and uh, working with all of you in the meantime on furthering our goal to make toxicity testing the 21st century 
uh, reality. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, everybody. And uh, until next time, take care, stay safe. Particular thanks to the presenters. All righty. Thank you. And the behind the scenes folks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.